Good afternoon and welcome to today's uh, COVID-19 weekly update. Uh, I'm pleased to be joined as usual by uh, Secretary Jose Romero of the Department of Health, uh, Secretary Johnny Key of the Department of Education, and uh, today we have uh, a couple special guests, which is uh, Dr. Michelle Smith, uh, the Director of the Office of Health Equity at the Department of Health, and Dr. Marlene Battle of D&D Pharmacy here in Little Rock. And a special treat today, we have Dr. Dillahay, who has not been here recently, so uh, welcome and thank you for your work. And of course, Colonel Rob Ader as well, uh, who's leading uh, our vaccination uh, administration work. <clears throat> Today, uh, we'll give our usual uh, case report, vaccination report. And I want to emphasize today the importance of, of getting vaccinations out in a minority community, which currently is, is behind in terms of their vaccination as compared to the percent of the population. And so we want to continue to emphasize the equity of our vaccine distribution and how important it is in every aspect uh, of uh, our uh, communities here in Arkansas. Uh, let's uh, first look at our uh, re case report, which puts everything in perspective. On the top left is our cases over the last 24 hours. We see an additional 163 cases uh, in Arkansas, new COVID cases. This is a little bit lower than last week, the same period of time. We're hovering around the same numbers through the course of the week, not going up, not dramatically going down. Uh, we have a small reduction in active cases. Uh, sadly, we have uh, five new additional Arkansans who have died uh, from this and uh, hospitalizations are up seven, and ventilators are up three, uh, not enough to establish any trend. They're still in a very low number, but uh, I ask uh, Dr. Romero and Dr. Delahaye, do we still have community spread of COVID-19 in Arkansas? And the answer was yes. And uh, that's just a reminder to us that when you think about 163 Arkansans that we have tested positive for COVID-19, you multiply that by a, a higher number that are likely to be infected in Arkansas, just haven't been tested, uh, then uh, you're getting to see a number that you have to be mindful that COVID-19 is still in our communities. And whenever we're getting people vaccinated, you don't want to catch COVID-19 when the vaccination is available to you. And so that is really an important reminder for everyone. If you look at our vaccinations, on our bottom left, uh, we've had uh, uh, 58,000 new doses received from yesterday. We've uh, distributed 25,000 uh, doses of the vaccine, which is a good performance for 24 hours. The percent, of course, does not go up whenever we get the load of uh, vaccines that come in. Uh, if you look, though, at the, those that have uh, been partially immunized at 357,000 and fully immunized at 477,000, you add those together and you have over, well over 800,000 Arkansans that have been partially or fully immunized. And the more that goes up, the better chance we have of uh, decreasing the likelihood of our cases going up. Our testing remains uh, light, uh, but uh, that's understandable whenever you have a low case count and people are getting immunized. Uh, uh, if you go to the uh, next one, I wanted to break down a little bit of the population. Here, these are uh, individuals fully vaccinated in Arkansas versus the population estimate. And so of White Arkansans, you have 77% uh, that have been vaccinated uh, with 81% representing the population. So at 77% of all vaccinations out there have gone to White Arkansans. Uh, in contrast to African Americans, uh, you see that 10% of all of the vaccines are going to African Americans, but they represent 15 plus percent of the population. Uh, the other numbers uh, you know, are very, very close, but it shows that we have to continue to work to overcome a historic reservation and concerns about vaccination in the minority community. 
And uh, that's why I appreciate the work of our Minority Health Commission as well as our Chief Equity Officer that works on this. If you go to the next one, you'll see a, an age breakdown. And this is encouraging because 65 plus is the age group with the greatest vulnerability uh, to hospitalization and death because of COVID-19. And here we have 19% partially vaccinated, fully vaccinated 45.3. And so that is 64.5% uh, of our 65 plus population has been vaccinated. Uh, we want to keep that high. We want to get it higher. But this is good news uh, for that population and the success of our vaccination efforts. And then uh, for those who want to get a vaccination, 16 plus, please call the vaccine call line 1-800-985-6030. Call that number and our uh, call center at the Department of Health will help you identify the options as to where you can go and get a reservation for a vaccine, what clinics are available to you. We're happy to help. Call that vaccine call line soon uh, to get uh, in line for the vaccine. With that, uh, let me uh, invite uh, Dr. Michelle Smith first, our Director of Office of Health Equity of the Department of Health, for her comments as to how we're reaching the minority population. And then Dr. Battle, if you could come up right after that and talk about uh, your outreach, that would be good, please. Thank you, Governor Hutchinson, uh, for this opportunity to share the ongoing work from the Office of Health Equity as it relates to the COVID-19 response. As vaccine distribution continues, ensuring racial equity is important for mitigating the disproportionate impacts on people of color, preventing widening health disparities, and achieving broad population immunity. To that end, in January, we developed health equity strike teams to assist state efforts in ensuring special populations have equal access to vaccine distribution sites. These populations include racial and ethnic minorities, people living with disabilities, faith-based organizations, rural communities, and elderly populations. Teams are dispatched into counties that have low vaccination rates and they work with local leaders, including mayors, state representatives, church leaders, and civic groups. They comprise of nurses, health educators, public information specialists, and lay community members with skill sets needed to foster community relationships, address hesitancy, and encourage vaccine participation. Health equity strike teams also utilize 80 to 135 volunteers that help staff these clinics. As a result of these efforts, which began in January, over 12,000 first and 12 and second dose vaccines have been administered throughout Jefferson, Pulaski, Deshay, St. Francis, Crittenden, and Sebastian counties. With the elimination of phases and the hiring of 30 employees, additional health equity strike teams are now being deployed in more locations across the state. The goal for the month of April is to administer 8,000 vaccines with 50% or greater being among minority groups. This goal will be achieved with partnerships with the Arkansas um, Pharmacists Association, Black Mayors Association, Blue Cross Blue Shield, UAMS, Baptist Health, and NYIT Jonesboro. In addition, collaboration with Black fraternity and sorority chapters across the state have proved to be highly effective in increasing turnout at these events. At all of these clinics, you will see volunteers wearing the Blue Cross Vaccinate the Natural State in their organization's colors. Local pharmacies have also worked with social groups and the Mexican consulate and faith-based institutions to offer vaccinations in locations that are more accessible to these populations. Upcoming first dose clinics this week include a Johnson & Johnson clinic from 10 to 3 p.m. at Shorter College in North Little Rock on tomorrow. And on Sunday, the strike team will administer J&J vaccines in Forest City at the Larry S. Bryant Center. For a list of these and other health equity clinics, including local health unit vaccination locations, you can go to the ADH website, 
To make appointments, you can call the 800 number or you can just walk in at the clinics and we will work you in the schedule. Lastly, as more become fully vaccinated, we need more volunteers to assist at these clinics. Volunteering has many forms and can range from assisting someone who may not have transportation, internet access, or it may be a way to reassure someone who is still uncertain about getting vaccinated. Those that do come to the clinics have found volunteering as a way to give back to the community, to get out of the house, to see friends, and other find it as a way to honor loved ones that they have lost due to COVID-19. Whatever your expertise or motivation, we welcome you to sign up to help. We would also like to thank the over 500 volunteers that have already assisted in these efforts. And if you are interested, you can call our office at 501-661-2622. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor Hutchison and Secretary Romero for giving me the opportunity to share with you from the pharmacy community and the work that we have been doing at D&D Pharmacy that's located within the Arkansas Diagnostic Center led by Dr. Alonzo Williams Sr. Dr. Williams welcomed the opportunity to further serve the community by opening the doors of D&D Pharmacy to provide a familiar and trustworthy vaccination site for the citizens of Arkansas, especially our minority population. Myself, along with all the other pharmacists across the state, we have been working tirelessly to ensure that every Arkansan who is eligible to receive the vaccine can get it. In addition to the vaccines that I have administered at my job, I have volunteered with the health equity strike teams to administer vaccines at a local church ensuring that the minority population and other special populations are being vaccinated. We must continue to encourage people to overcome their doubts and their fears. For those of us who have been vaccinated, let us be ambassadors in spreading the word to others on getting the vaccine. For anyone wanting to get the vaccine, D&D Pharmacy will be offering a drive through vaccination clinic this Saturday. For more information and to pre-register for this vaccination clinic, you can go to adcgca.com. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Battle. And now we'll hear a quick report from uh, Dr. Romero, uh, who uh, will uh, talk about the importance of the second dose and then uh, ask uh, Secretary uh, Key to come and give an update on our schools. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon. Um, I want to remind everyone of, a, of the importance of getting the second vaccine dose if you have received either the Pfizer or the Moderna vaccine. Um, remember, only the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a single-dose vaccine. We're starting to see increasing numbers of individuals that aren't returning or have missed their second dose, and we want them to please catch up on that. Now, even if you miss your window, um, you can call the 1-800 number and we can tell you where to go to get that second dose. It's very important that you become fully immunized uh, with the vaccine. We are doing well um, and uh, striving to reach minority communities and that has been spoken to already. Um, with the governor's permission, I will direct a few words to the Spanish speaking population that might be listening. Quiero decirles que es muy importante de que de que consigan la vacuna, estar uh, disponible en muchos sitios en este momento. La vacuna es gratuita, eh, no se requiere de licencia ni de ciudadanía para re recibir la vacuna. Eh, la vacuna es segura y eficaz. Previene la hospitalización y la muerte en el 90% o más de los casos. Entonces, por favor, tomen, tomen esta oportunidad de, de, de vacunarse y también eh, hablen con sus vecinos, su familia, para que ellos también reciban la vacuna. Cualquier persona de 16 años en adelante pueden recibir la vacuna. Thank you very much, Governor. For Secretary Key, I did want to set the stage that uh, it is important for those 16 plus to get vaccinated, which means uh, some of those that are eligible to be vaccinated are still in high school. 
and we have vaccines that are available. We want to utilize those in the schools that want to make sure uh, the students are, uh, have vaccines that are available to them. And we really want to pilot this now while school is in session so we can be ready uh, for the fall. And the fall, of course, we hope that uh, we will have uh, FDA approval for use of the vaccine in 12 and above so that we will have a very comprehensive uh, vaccination program in, available for our students at that age. And so uh, with that, Secretary Key. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the school year is uh, beginning to wind down. This week marks the beginning of our testing window. And yesterday being the first day, we administered over 44,000 tests across the state. That's, uh, that shows that we are getting back to normal and we are doing the things that our, our kids expect, our families expect, and the things that our teachers need and our, our schools need so that they can understand what the impact of this COVID-19 uh, situation has done to the learning uh, on the student level. As the governor said, it's uh, very important that we consider uh, the eligibility of those that are 16 and over and the opportunities that we might have uh, in our schools to be able to administer uh, vaccines to those students that are eligible. I uh, would just say that, uh, that that is something that we will be working with the health department, uh, with the physicians groups, uh, the primary care physicians and pediatricians uh, and our school districts uh, to help set up uh, the, these opportunities because if we can uh, get more of these students uh, their vaccine, both doses of their vaccines, Dr. Romero, uh, before school's out, it will help us set the stage for a good summer and as the governor said, uh, returning to school in the fall. Thank you, Johnny. And with that, uh, we'll take any questions. Andy, do you have anything? Anything that you think might change that to get more people to get vaccinated? Uh, well, sure. Well, I'm concerned about uh, uh, the race to get everybody vaccinated and uh, how we're doing in that regard. Right now, you, we have a low new case count, uh, but the national experts say that uh, you know when you see the trend line and what is it, 16 states, the cases are going up. You see what's happened in Europe. Uh, we recognize, uh, based upon historic patterns, that uh, that could come to Arkansas. Uh, and the only way to prevent that is to beat uh, the spread of COVID through more vaccinations. So vaccinations are critically important. We want to get them out as fast as we can. Uh, there, we have to overcome resistance. Uh, we have to overcome the challenges of a rural state. And so while we're making a great deal of progress there, everything we can do to accelerate that and so that people do not, do not take it for granted that we have low cases, uh, you know, uh, some of the restrictions are off, all the restrictions are off. Uh, you see people going to Major League Baseball uh, opening day with the Texas Rangers and so people relax and they think it's not something we need to worry about. It is and we still need to get vaccinated. So yes, uh, that's the emphasis on it. And that's one of the reasons for uh, having uh, Dr. Smith and uh, Dr. Battle here today. Uh, let me go uh, remotely. And is there a broadcast uh, journalist from uh, Central Arkansas that has a question? Yes, this is Alex with Channel 7. Uh, what are your thoughts on vaccine passports and would you consider banning them as Governor Abbott just did? My second question is regarding the House that just uh, overrode your veto of HB 1570. Do you have a reaction to that? Uh, first, in reference to the uh, idea of the vaccine passport, uh, I think we have to uh, give latitude toward uh, businesses and the private sector uh, so that if uh, you know, an employer uh, wants to have everyone vaccinated in their workplace, that they have the prerogative to do that. Uh, as uh, you know, we have drug testing and uh, if they have a sensitive environment, they want to make sure you have the highest quality of uh, precautions. Uh, 
against COVID, then that's the private sector and their, their uh, uh, right to uh, protect their workplace. Uh, no, I don't think that it should be a condition of travel. Uh, so I think you have to hesitate about that, but uh, I want everybody to get vaccinated, but, uh, and, and I know that there'll be some venues that will require vaccination and, and it will, it will allow access. You look at the cruise lines right now that are looking at <clears throat> opening back up and they want to be able to do business, but it's an assurance if they have people that go on the cruise line vaccinated. If I was going on a cruise line, I would feel more comfortable if they had an all vaccination policy. Uh, that way you feel safe. And so I think you have to give latitude to the private sector. As a government, no, the state is not gonna be requiring and mandating vaccinations. Uh, is there another question? Yes, this is Melissa Zigowitz with THB11. Um, recent CDC numbers show variants of concern may make up over half of new COVID cases nationally. Uh, do we know how many of Arkansas's new cases are caused by variants of concern? Uh, I'm gonna let Dr. Romero uh, comment on that. Uh, before I do, I should have answered the second part of the question uh, uh, before, and that was uh, my reaction to the House overriding uh, my veto uh, on House Bill 1520, the uh, one that I vetoed yesterday. As I said yesterday, I fully expected uh, both the House and Senate uh, to override the veto based upon the large majority that uh, supported it initially. So <clears throat> I don't consider it a surprise. <clears throat> I stated my convictions and belief yesterday, and uh, I understand uh, uh, their vote and the support for the House and Senate. With that, Dr. Romero, do you want to comment on the variance? <clears throat> So we're, not, we're unable to give you specifics about the number of isolates uh, that uh, we have in positive cases as variants because we don't sequence every one of them. But what we do know is that the number is increasing within the state. Last week we had um, three variants identified. We have about 18 to 19 variants so far identified since the beginning of March, and we are following this on a weekly basis. We are also increasing the number of isolates that are being sent for sequencing and for uh, genomic determination. So uh, we're keeping a very close eye on this. We're not seeing increase in the number of cases. Uh, we know that these variants are highly transmissible and they have an increased um, virulence, if you will, or lethality. Thank you. We'll turn the microphone open for anyone who has a question. Um, sure, Governor. This is Benjamin Hardy with the Arkansas Nonprofit News Network. Um, so as far as the outreach to um, the African-American community goes, um, as I know you're aware, there's been a lot of polling that shows uh, the groups that are most hesitant to take the vaccine tend to be uh, Republicans and white evangelical Christians. And I just wondered if there is going to be any sort of specific outreach targeted towards those groups, um, either uh, through, the, through churches or, or other means. Uh, I, I think they're doing fine. <laughs> uh, there's, uh, you know, some resistance, but, uh, you know, our focus today is on the minority population <clears throat> and getting it out more broadly as a whole. And so, uh, you know, in terms of our advertising campaign, we have influencers, we have those that uh, are respected in the community, uh, we have national leaders that are communicating it, and so, uh, and, and we're also utilizing uh, our employers and the education that takes place in the workforce. Uh, I just talked to uh, yesterday to uh, uh, Rajesh uh, Shikani, the uh, Chief Operating Officer of Wellspun, and he talked about what he did in his workplace of bringing in uh, physicians that uh, taught uh, the workplace and talked to them about uh, the uh, safety and efficacy of the vaccine and encourage those. And as a result of that, the percent went way up. So it's, it's an education effort that we're doing every day. <clears throat> Is there another question? Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, it's Brett Rains with 4029 News. Two quick questions. The CDC announced uh, nearly $30 million uh, for COVID vaccine expansions caveat is 75% of the funding must 
focused specifically for ethnic minority communities. Can you comment as Arkansas received that plans to use those funds? And second question is for Dr. Romero, who was in the Fort Smith area Friday, speaking, speaking specifically to members of the Latinx community. Was that effective? How did that go? And uh, just comment from him after your response. Thank you. Did you get that, Dr. Romero? Uh, why don't you answer that uh, part of the question? So that, that is correct. Um, I spent uh, uh, a Friday evening uh, in uh, Fort Smith uh, speaking primarily to the um, uh, Latino community, uh, both in an English and Spanish uh, dialogue, uh, answering questions uh, from um, a reporter and from um, the community. I think it went well. Um, I, the uh, purpose of the uh, uh, interview, if you will, was to uh, transmit information regarding the importance of vaccination, the safety of vaccination, and uh, the availability of the vaccine for all people within the state. Um, and I think it, uh, it, was, uh, it, it uh, was well received. Thank you. And Brett, in terms of the first part of the question, I was on a call with the uh, White House today. Vice President Harris was uh, on the call as well. And uh, I believe it's five billion uh, nationally will be dedicated to uh, minority outreach. Much of this will be through our community health centers and through our departments of health. Uh, we're still waiting details on the allocation of that money. Uh, right now, uh, money is not an obstacle. Uh, we have resources that we're putting into play uh, to make sure we have those outreach programs. There could be some uh, particular assistance in, uh, they mentioned that it could be available to use for actually going door to door, uh, marketing uh, the vaccine and trying to encourage everyone to get the vaccine. So uh, we will uh, stay tuned. We'll continue to uh, look at the uh, specific guidelines as we uh, have opportunity to access that, those funds. Testing, uh, is that being affected in any way by the uh, uh, lifting of the mask mandate? And uh, is there any penalty for students who don't want to take the test? The, the question was, uh, is the Aspire testing affected in any way by the lifting of the mask mandate? Uh, I would say that, uh, that no. I mean, by the first day's numbers, uh, it's apparent that uh, there's a very strong day of testing. So uh, our schools are, are trying to, many of them are getting an early start on that. The window lasts, uh, I believe, over the next six weeks. Um, I, I don't foresee any issues there. We have been very flexible with uh, our schools in setting up alternative sites uh, so that anyone who, uh, you know, parent that may have chosen uh, virtual learning for the whole year uh, could take their child to a setting that was uh, um, not necessarily the traditional school setting uh, but would have reduced numbers. Uh, we are allowing uh, weekend testing. Uh, we're, we're allowing many uh, options that were not available in the past uh, so that the, 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 any fear could be remedied by uh, those options. Uh, what was the second part, Andy? Penalty for masking. There is no individual penalty to students uh, for for not testing. We are encouraging everyone, whether they are in person uh, or whether they are remote, every uh, parent uh, to have their kid uh, test, their student tested. Um, allow them to come on site. Allow them to experience these alternative situations so that they can test in a safe environment. But there is no individual penalty. There is no student level penalty. Uh, the the uh, aggregate that we're shooting for is 95%. Uh, we will look to see where we are at the end of the testing cycle and determine, and we have been in contact with the U.S. Department of Education, and at that point we can determine whether we need a waiver uh, from the federal 95% requirement. Is there a final question? Yes, Governor, now that it's been a week since you lifted the mask mandate, some people may have observed changes in behavior, people not wearing their masks. What have you observed and does it concern you? Actually, I've been impressed with uh, the uh, response. Uh, I've been to uh, church services in which everyone is wearing a mask in the church service. 
uh, you feel very safe. Uh, you go into restaurants and, uh, uh, you know, I had a telephone call and it reminded me to get my mask on. Uh, and so uh, the businesses are making their decisions to keep their workplace safe. Uh, you see schools responding. Many, some of the rural schools are lifting the mask mandate in the schools. Some of the urban schools with a denser population and students, number of students, uh, are keeping the mask mandate in place. To me, that is the essence of, uh, of community influence on uh, the uh, mask and how that should be handled. And uh, that is really where we are with the uh, virus today, with a low number of cases. I think we're at the right spot with that. And I've been very pleased with the response and the responsibility that everyone has demonstrated uh, since the uh, statewide mandate was uh, lifted. Thank you very much.